distinct pleasure and honor uh, to welcome Jill Moore to our campus today. Uh, Jill, uh, I met uh, over, uh, I think, at an event at the university uh, around entrepreneurship and was inspired not just by her story of her interest in, in world travel and, and study abroad, which was kind of like part of the reason why she got excited um, uh, about travel and about doing all kinds of things, but also her own uh, taking responsibility uh, for creating some things that could help herself and other people. And it really is an inspiring story, so I'm, I'm thrilled that she's here at Parkland. I'm sorry that more people aren't going to get to see it, but we will be recording it and broadcasting it uh, so that people will get an opportunity to hear your story. And thank you again so much for being here. Well, thank you for having me. I feel really important. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they gave me a clicker. I have like two microphones, so like this is about to be out of this world. But my name is Jill, and I appreciate those of you guys who did come out. Um, it's an absolute honor to be here. And I do wheelchair racing. I compete at the U of I. And so I'm here today to kind of talk to you about my story, what I've come from, di from disability, and how I've tried to transform that into something that's going to make a better world for those to come. So thank you all for coming. And in case you've missed a very obvious memo, I am indeed in a wheelchair. And <laughs> Like, this is fun. Like, I love being in a chair because the most ridiculous stuff happens to me and it's just, it flies. Like, everyone thinks it's normal. Like, I was pushing around yesterday and someone stopped me and like, no hello, no like, how are you? Just like, what happened to you? And like, that happens all the time. I was at the bars once and some guy stopped me and said, so what project is this for? And I was like, I don't know, real life? <laughs> and so, like, I got, like creative with this stuff and you got to come up with answers over the years and so the lady who asked me yesterday what happened to you I was like well I pissed off a magician <laughs> I, I used to tell my neighbors kids that I babysat they really whenever they bothered me and they wouldn't eat I tell them when you don't eat your vegetables this happens to you oh. or too many video games I've used that too but in reality I was born with a birth defect so my spinal column didn't close all the way so I have a hole in my spine and it formed slightly out of my back so they had to go in and fix that and with my disability it can range from the best they're like it can it's all over the spectrum um, people can be born with it and be in power chairs have spinal fluid leaking or it could be so mild some of you could have it and you'd never know but I was fortunate enough to have the best of the worst so I'm in a chair but I have all cognitive function um, I can't feel from here down, and that's the extent of it. Otherwise, I get really, really good parking. But <laughs> I, because of this disability, was the freaking cutest child ever. Like, I was adorable. And you may think, no, Jill, you're the cutest child, where you're so wrong, because look at my hat. But that's OK, because puberty took a toll on me. We'll get there. You'll see it. It's a terrible time in my life. But when I was not cruising around with my rocket ship with the men in my life, I was either crawling, scooting around in my little stroller, walking in a walker, and like I had a setup, man. I was like Forrest Gump over there, or on my cute little crutches. And so, I mean, as a child, when you're born with a disability like that and you are traveling differently, you're a little bit slower. And that's insanely, insanely frustrating because imagine yourself at playtime when it was very important for you to go run and be around the playground with your friends, but I couldn't do that because I couldn't keep up. And I was a child, so it was very, very frustrating to have no understanding of why this was happening to me. I was very, very different. And so that took a toll on my confidence growing up. I, I felt different. I felt like I didn't fit in. And then at my school, the only other people with disabilities there also had cognitive impairments. And so a lot of the time, I got grouped in with them. But I would get grouped in with the other kids. And they were all wonderful, very, very sweet. But a lot of the time, I, I, was on a, I wanted to play. I could function just like the other kids around me. And these kids had to be in a room where people helped them all day long. And I didn't need that. And so that was very, very challenging as a child because that took a toll on my confidence. That took a toll on how people interacted with me. And it was very, very frustrating. Um, so it always really was troublesome growing up because I always felt like I, I couldn't be involved and I wanted to play with my friends but I couldn't keep up and so when I had the first opportunity to get involved into wheelchair sports I didn't want to do it I thought this is the world's way of handing me a participation trophy I was nine years old and I thought there's no way I'm going to do this because I'm above this I want to be normal I want to be just like everybody else and <coughs> after 
a lot of convincing, and I think my parents had to actually drag me onto the plane, I was able to go to my first basketball tournament. And when I got there, we had one game, and then it was in Baltimore, Maryland, we got a meter of snow. And so like the whole city shut down. And so it was a bunch of like nine-year-olds in wheelchairs stuck in a hotel conference room. And being the scholars that a bunch of nine-year-olds are when given really heavy, durable wheelchairs, we invented, oh, there I am again, God, I'm so cute. We invented a little game. And this game was called Ramarama. And Ramarama is very, very, very complicated, let me tell you. So, Ramarama would be one kid in one basketball chair, the other kid in another basketball chair on opposite sides of the room. You would sprint full speed and just see how hard you could run into each other. We beat the snot out of each other, and needless to say, our parents were none too thrilled with this. But Ramarama, as dumb of a game as it is, was absolutely essential in my life because that taught me something that I don't think anything else could have. It taught me that when I wasn't breakable, that I could fall on the floor and get run over by some other angsty nine-year-old and be fine. I was a strong enough person that my disability was not getting in the way of this. And so after this, um, I got involved in everything I could. I'm still going, wow, look at me. But I got involved with a lot of sports and I was able to do a lot of this because I have the most supportive parents in the whole wide world. They are terrible people. As in, they'll leave my wheelchair at a Walmart. They've done that countless occasions. One time they left it at a Cracker Barrel and threatened to never come back for it. Um, my dad let it fall out of his car. They put my chair in the pool once just to see like if it could float or anything. Like they're terrible people. But they're also the biggest supporters in the world for me. And so they saw this opportunity to get into sports and long before I was sold on the idea, they pushed it and they wanted me involved and there they are, they're ridiculous. They supported some really, really incredible things. Oh, also, terrible story. I wanted to be a cat one year for Halloween, but my mom didn't want to buy me a new costume, so she convinced me Dalmatian cats were a thing. <laughs> so, um, oh, they also did that to me one year. Uh, I had an amazing community of people around me as well as my parents. This is my neighbor, and he converted a lawnmower into a go-kart so I could ride it around with his kids. It was really, really cool. But uh, around the age of nine, I joined track and started going around the states. Prior to that, I'd been trying to get involved in as many things as possible. Um, it was very, very hard to do because we didn't know. There's not a lot of word around disability sport. And so I tried to get involved with a lot of things, and my wonderful parents tried everything they absolutely could. They got me in horseback riding. They had gotten me that ridiculous go-kart called the Jill Mobile, which I thought was clever. Um, they would take me rock climbing when I could. They had taken me ice skating, we saw that there. They're all very avid scuba divers, so when I was around eight, they got me in a junior scuba program, which was really cool. But none of this was active enough still. I wanted to be involved. I wanted to feel like I was actually doing a competitive sport. I wanted to feel like I was going somewhere. They also tried to get me involved in instruments, but I'm tone deaf, so that didn't work out for anybody involved. It's, it's no. <laughs> but uh, the real breaking point for me was cheerleading. Um, they stuck me in this little outfit and everything like that, and I had to shout, but I hated it because there's no smooth way to integrate a wheelchair into cheer routines. And so I would get so frustrated, I'd get embarrassed, I wanted to be the one out there playing, but I could never be that person just because I didn't know there was any way I could get out there. And so they, being the ridiculous people they are, did a 150 mile bike ride to the beach every year. And one day when I was like, some obscenely young age that no one should say yes to, I asked if I could join, and they said yes. I don't know why you would do that for your like eight-year-old, but my parents are incredible. And so I sat on the back of my dad's bike for 150 miles telling him your mama jokes until we got to the beach. <laughs> but while we were on that bike ride, we met a man who was in a wheelchair, and I had never really seen somebody in a chair doing sports before. And so he was in a hand cycle, and he was like, well, hey, you're, you're disabled and you're doing this. You should really be doing something more. And I was like, well, like what? And he invited me to that basketball tournament. And so that's how I got involved with it all. And that was my first shot at actually doing something. So from then on out, I got to travel. Uh, I'd gone to my first tournament. There's me when puberty started to get a little rough. I looked like a thumb for a very long time. And I was off 
uh, at age nine or ten around my first US trip. So I got to go to my first games were in Connecticut, I believe, and we went up there and I competed in track, field, and swimming. And after that, I was able to get involved into some really amazing stuff. So that's my sister. Also, I have one of those that sometimes I'll acknowledge. But, um, so that's the race chair. The first one I was in was built for the guy, like, I think the fattest man who had ever done wheelchair racing. Mm -hmm. And so I just kind of could bathe in this wheelchair. I did not fit at all, but I was so hooked because it was so cool. I got to go, I got to push, I got to compete. I told you uh, it was just a little awkward in there. <laughs> um, but then I got involved in a lot of different sports because there is a lot of opportunity, but no one ever seems to know about it. Uh, so I got to do water skiing. Um, and then by age 14, I took my first international trip and competed on the USA team in Australia which was very, very, very cool. And so basketball originally was my passion. I fell in love with the sport. I wanted to do everything in it. But uh, shortly after I went to Australia, I was diagnosed with scoliosis. And scoliosis usually is pretty mild. It's when your spine starts to curve. And so my spine had started to go into an S shape. And they told me it was concerning, but not to worry about it yet. And then I think over the period of three months, my spine went from about 15 degrees to a curve to a roughly 90. And so they said if it continued at anything near that rate, uh, all of my organs were going to be crushed. And so they had to go in, there's my spine somewhere in transition, but they had to go in and fuse metal rods to my spine and straighten it out. And so that, became, that was a very extensive surgery. I think the total operating time was nine hours. And then after that, I was out of sports for about nine months trying to heal. And so once I did heal, basketball was never quite the same for me. So that had been the one I was internationally competitive in. That was the one I was going to college for. I was very, very passionate in basketball. But after this, it was very painful because my spine's fused. I couldn't get the same movement. I couldn't play the same game, essentially. And somewhere along the lines, oh, there's the comparatives. They really straighten that out. But somewhere along the lines, I broke it. So the quarter inch stainless steel rods in my spine this is, I broke both of them. That's where it broke. And then they had to go in and remove the other one. And so the rod removal went fine. It was helpful, but I still couldn't play the game of basketball like I really wanted to. And so, uh, like it was very, very passionate, like I said, set up to go to college. But then I got very, very involved with track because this was something I could do that didn't cause me pain that I was still competitive at, but I wasn't very passionate about it just yet. And so I joined my high school track team um, but the problem with that was it was illegal for me to compete and score points for my team because I had a disability. And so going into track, uh, it was kind of a scary thing because a lot of people were there telling me, you're a liability, you're unsafe, you shouldn't be on this track with these people. And so that, I mean, that's very disheartening as a teenager to hear. And I wanted to compete again and wanted to be with my friends, but I couldn't do that. And so what we had to do, me and my wonderful parents and this amazing community of people, had to go in, I'm from North Carolina, by the way, had to go in and establish a law in the state of North Carolina for people with wheelchairs to compete. And so we had a lot of adversity to that. Parents would come up to me and tell me I was not safe to compete alongside their child. I had one girl to this day, I don't know what happened, but she, right before we were about to start, her ankle was underneath my wheel. And I said, you need to move over. You're underneath my wheelchair. And she looked at me and said, oh, and did not move. And so when I hit her ankle off the start, because I thought, you know, she should move, she did not. And her coach came to me and said that I had injured his athlete and that I had put her at risk and I shouldn't be competing. And so things like that happened all through high school, but I'm glad they happened to me because I was the person to pave the way for anybody else in a chair who wants to go compete now. All because I had to suck it up and deal with this. But again, it was painful because it felt like a participation trophy. That was my high school team. They were amazing. They are a great group of people. But that was me at my last state championships. I remember one of the hardest parts besides being called a liability left and right was the first time I had to compete by myself. Because normally, in regular season meets, they would allow me to just race alongside with the girls despite the dumb girl whose ankle just happened to get in the way. But the first time I got to a state meet, I had to compete alone because they said that I'm in a separate event now, which I suppose made sense. 
But again, I felt like a big spectacle. So everybody had to stop the meet so the wheelchair race could run. Everybody was just cheering for the little girl in the wheelchair. And that was one of the hardest things I've ever had to do because I never wanted to be the spectacle. I wanted to compete. But fortunately enough, another girl in a chair came along and she raced alongside me. And it was amazing to get to see kids after me come through and not have a problem or a hitch because I did that. And so my senior year of high school, I competed in the Czech Republic in swimming, track, and field. I looked great while I did it. <laughs> um, I medaled in swimming. And that summer, I was able to get involved with a nonprofit that takes people with disabilities down to the Grand Cayman Islands and gets them certified in scuba diving. And that's one of the coolest, most rewarding programs I've been involved with. And so that's kind of where a love for innovation started because you have to figure out some really unique ways to get different disability into the water and diving and things like that. And that's one of the coolest experiences in my life because when you're scuba diving and underwater, disability doesn't matter. And so I think that kid on the far right, yeah, direction, his name's Marlon. And Marlon had recently been injured that year. He fell off of a balcony in Italy and broke his spine. And so Marlon came and was really hesitant to get involved with this program. And we all got in the water, and pretty immediately, we were waiting around for our, everybody to get in, but a turtle swam by. And so all the kids here were so stoked about this turtle, as one would be. It's pretty cool. But I couldn't find Marlin anywhere. And I was like, well, what's up with that? Like, I don't know how I lost you already. We've been here for, like, literally two minutes. But I looked behind me, and Marlin was just swimming in circles because he was so happy that he could move. Because once you look at this weird group of kids, you can't tell any of us are disabled. They're just all diving around and looking ridiculous swimming in circles. So this program became a very a big passion for me because we taught so many different people independence and how to facilitate overcoming adversity. That was me with the Stingray. They're like really big dogs. They're really awesome. But um, so I got some really cool opportunity with that. And I got to take that, like you saw in my video, I got to go to the Maldives for a week and dive there. But I signed for college and I chose U of I. So when I got to U of I, I was in advertising. And I liked it okay, I really wanted to do creative content, but I did not love it. And I was also racing here, and I was racing, I had yet to reach a really competitive level yet, but I did that for a while. That was me in the Chicago Marathon. And then finally last year, I made my first Team USA event. And so I got to go to the Para Pan Am Games in Toronto back in August, and then I got to go to the World Championships in Doha. And so this year we have Rio coming up, and the qualifier for that is in July, so we won't know officially until then, but hopefully get to continue representing my country, because that's pretty dang cool. But last semester, I got to go to Singapore, as you saw, and I had some really awesome opportunities there. I got to go to Doha to compete, that was over there. And so it's, just, it's very cool to see where my disability has taken me and where this overcoming adversity has gone. I got to model some couture for a local designer in Champagne, which was really cool. Uh, I got to go to London to watch the 2012 Paralympics. But one of the most impactful things for me was getting involved in design. So when I got to U of I, like I said, I was in advertising and I enjoyed it, but I wasn't super passionate about it. And I took a drawing course for non-majors. And when I got to my drawing course, there was an easel that didn't fit my wheelchair. And I'm like, that sucks, because like, you want to draw. And so my teacher told me, well, why don't we just design one that could fit? And I was like, you are insane. But of course, like, you can do that. And so we completely redesigned an easel, and I fell in love with this idea. I was like, well, how can I use what I know and what I've been through to create something better? And so I got involved with product design. And through industrial design, I went on my study abroad program to Singapore, and I got involved in medical design, which is really cool. And this is what this photo is from. Um, we were challenged with this idea of creating a tool for shoulder, shoulder dislocation surgeries. And this is what we came up with. So when you dislocate your shoulder and you fall, you get a dent in there. And if you have this dent, it makes it a lot easier for your shoulder to slip in and out of place and continue to dislocate it. And so our team was tasked, well, how can we create a surgical tool that fix this? Because, because right now they don't have one. Um, when they go in and tie the sutures, it's all arthroscopic. So when they're going into your shoulder to tie it, they're doing it blindly. And so the longer they're staying in a shoulder, the more dangerous it is and creates 
more problems for the patient. And so our team designed a tool. And we created a tool that eliminated the problem, it eliminated the blind suturing, made the procedure a lot quicker, and our doctor really liked it. And so we were gonna go through and get a patent on it, which I think is like stinking cool, because I got to design a surgical tool. But, um, so it was very successful, that went well, and I realized, wow, I have this massive passion for creating medical devices, because I get to consider a lot of things with medical design, such as how does my disability factor in? How would somebody with a disability, a more severe disability, how would that factor in? And so I feel through all these life experiences of ridiculousness and all the ups and downs and everything like that, I've gotten some really cool perspective on how to use that to change a lot of product designs available. And so I've gotten to work with this. Um, I've gotten to work with, there's a girl at the U of I who's creating racing gloves. She's learning how to 3D print those for like a grassroots people who are learning how to push. So I've gotten to be involved with her projects. I've gotten to be involved with a lot of just disability accessories that people don't tend to think about. But like, so I really want to use the knowledge I've procured to help change these designs down the road. And so there's the rest of our system. We got to try it out on like a pig, a pig shoulder thing that we procured. I don't know where, but it worked. And so that was pretty cool. But uh, my second project while I was over there was we had to redesign a waiting room experience. And again, I got to factor in a lot of things about disability that I've learned through the years that I would never really consider. And so a lot of this adversity has made me me, I realized. A lot of going down the road and having all these ups and downs and trials and confidence issues as well as really tacky medical issues and surgeries and countless experiences like this has created something that I can use to integrate. And so I highly recommend to all of you, I suppose, to find that thing in your life that you can use to push whatever you do to the next level. And so I think that's all I can think to say. I mean, yeah. I'm a very directionally challenged human in life. Um, so I think a lot of that was due to me just getting here. But as far as getting to Parkland goes, I mean, as soon as I came in the door, I've noticed you guys have a really nice set, set up when it comes to accessibility. I mean, it seems like a lot of the buildings look like they could get a little convoluted, but uh, just coming in, everything was very easy to navigate and move around with. So kudos. Really? Okay. So we didn't have to retrofit any ramps. That's good. A lot of the ramps, because they've had to do that on U of I's campus oh, yeah. where they've retrofitted ramps, and like, that's a death-defying stunt on some of those. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Singapore seems to be a, like a pretty modern city. What did you find it to be like there in terms of accessibility? Um, it was different. So uh, some of the, the newer parts were accessible, but then they... Uh, they don't do a really good job of integrating their disabled into the community. And so it's things that they say are like textbook definition accessible, but aren't. So my dorm, for example, my dorm was the worst situation in the world. So I kid you not, it was called the Cock House and it was an all male dorm. And they put me in there because it was the only place with that like textbook accessible room. And it was on the top of this massive hill and it didn't have air conditioning, and so their weather is like 85 and really humid all the time. And it was infested with cockroaches. But that was okay because it was also infested with lizards, and those ate those. And so I put up a massive fight, because obviously that's not a good living condition. And so I put up a really, really big fight to say this isn't going to work for anybody, let alone somebody with a chair, because there's a lot of things that just don't function. Like there's a step to get up to the laundry, my bathroom, the, it wasn't really accessible in there. And so when I put up this big fight and said there's a new dorm literally right across the street, uh, it's got everything's flat, everything's brand new, I can fit. But they told me no, you can't live there because if there's an emergency, there's no room on the first floor we can put you on and you won't be able to get out. And so like I guess they just assumed I was going to like lay there and die. but. It's a very parental system. And so a lot of the times it's just people who haven't experienced being disabled running the, running the show. Or like they'd have sidewalks that were really narrow but put a pole right in the middle. So like, I can't navigate around that, but I mean, it's just things that they hadn't factored in. And that's because you were saying that they don't integrate their, their... They really hide them. Like when I was over there, I was a spectacle, I felt like, all the time, just because they don't, the people with disabilities they have over there, 
they tend to kind of push to the side or just not encourage them to get involved, not encourage them to lead a normal life, essentially, which is devastating, I think. But I saw very few people with disabilities. Were you able to talk to people in general about, I mean, you do more things than half the people I know. <laughs> I mean, were you able to, to talk to the people there? I got to do this speech before, actually. Um, I got to do that over there, which was good. But I was able to talk to some. A lot of the times, people didn't necessarily want to listen. So they have a very closed mentality about it. So I'd say, oh, I'm disabled. Oh, I can do things. And they'd kind of pat me in the head and say, oh, that's nice, but not really buy into it. And so it was, it was a very different way of doing things over there, I suppose. So they were very welcoming. I mean, people were helpful, but like, it got onto the point of insulting helpful instead of actually being constructive. So they weren't really open for a dialogue. Hi, uh, so you were talking about when you were in high school and uh, the law that you were able to pass in North Carolina. Mm -hmm. so what, what year was that? I think the initial, we initially started talking about that. When did I start high school? Uh, I want to say around 08 time frame. I think so. I had a really good group of people working alongside me. Like everyone in my school was very gung ho about bringing it forward. We got a lot of pushback from the other schools, but overall, the right people were behind it. So I wonder, like, aside from everything you were there for, what was the coolest thing you got to see? Oh man. Um. It looked absolutely. It was awesome. So. Towards the end, when I, I mean, people were making their decision, because we got out of school in early November. We were done with everything, and so we had about a month to kill. And people were making the decision either, do we go around to a lot of different countries and see Asia, or what are we going to do, or have, like, what a nice place. And so I learned very quickly. I went to Indonesia in the middle, and I learned that that's a gamble with a wheelchair. And so a lot of the underdeveloped Asian areas are nowhere near accessible. And it's not exactly like they were making temples ADA compliant. And so I made the decision to go to the Maldives for a week by myself. And I lived on a boat. And we just took the boat around to all different islands. And you get up every day at like 6 in the morning and go diving and then go to bed at like 10, have been diving all day. And so I think that was one of the coolest experiences of my life because that was just me on a boat in the middle of some ocean and that was really cool and we had to see manta rays like you saw and those things i think are on average 26 feet wingtip to wingtip 26 feet. some of them can go up to 26 feet <laughs> they were really big i really like medical design but um so it kind of doesn't really sound glamorous, but I really want to do it. So disposable medical supplies are very interesting to me. So like wound care, continence care, things like that. And those are things I've grown up having to deal with, with a disability. You have to know these products in and out. And so I met with a team of designers behind a group that makes a specific kind of cath tube. And she was telling me all the ups and downs about this cath tube. And I was like, I had to use that once. That thing was terrible absolutely terrible and these are things people with disabilities discuss regularly like we know the ins and outs of what makes a good cath tube which isn't glamorous but it's something a lot of people don't have to consider and then you realize that these are the people who are designing these products that I have to use on the daily and so I realized that user experience in terms of industrial design is what makes and breaks a product and I think that's a very very beneficial aspect for a designer and I get to bring that to the table. So that's where I would love to go with that. Right now, um, I'm finishing up a, a random project we're doing currently. We have to design a trade show space if commercial space travel was available. So it's fun, but it's not exactly what I want to do. But um, we're doing that and finishing up projects with school and everything. And then next year, we have our thesis and then looking into disposable medical care or um, just something with a really good, like how do I translate user experience to what's going into the product? Yes, so I mean, that's one of my most favorite things about being part of that program with Stay Focused because you meet people from every walk of disability. So whether they had just become disabled, whether they've been disabled all their lives, and you get to hear about their experiences with things. Like 
ridiculous stuff like how they learn to use a cath tube. Because I mean, a lot, it's not a glorious side of wheelchairs, but I mean, you have to deal with it. And so you, you get to consider all of these things. And like this program's so special because you get to see kids that have never had the opportunity to be independent and travel and do all these cool things with sports. They enter their own new world because they don't, they don't need their chair. And so you get to see their world change. And we bring them back for another trip. So they get to do two years in Cayman. And it's, all, it's a nonprofit and it's all free for them, which is really, really cool. But they get to come back and you get to see how this has, one trip, one week, has changed their goals and their, their complete outlook and the way they do things.